uh, we have this amazing talk today from Dan, uh, our design systems guru. Uh, he's going to do a little bit of that and, and talk to you about how you want to start your design systems. After that, we'll have a Q&A. So make sure to put your Q&As in the Q&A section. And then afterwards, me and Dan will be answering them. Great. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dan, maybe I can invite you up here and you can introduce yourself and uh, take it away. Awesome, Mike. Thank you so much for that. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Mall. Um, I, as Nico mentioned, and Mike mentioned, I run Design System University, which I can tell you about a little bit later. And happy to be here with all of you to share some share some stuff with you. Mike, thanks for having me. Zeppelin team, thanks for having me. Yeah. All righty. So I'm going to get started. We've got a few minutes here. I'm going to share some, some things. As Mike said, I'll share some tips, some tricks. The first thing that I have to share is happy... Over, long overdue day to all you sports fans. Uh, Joel Embiid won the NBA MVP last night. It's long overdue. I'm representing with my jersey here. So for all you Philly folks in the chat, thanks for representing. If you live in Jersey too, that counts. Uh, so thanks for all that. Um, it's a great day uh, because of all of it. All right, let's get set up here. I'll share some of my slides and we'll get cracking. All righty. Um, as I said, my name is Dan Mall. Uh, for the last decade, for those of you who don't know me, I used to run a design system consultancy. So we're here to talk about design systems. I've been spending a lot of time there over the last decade and certainly in the last five years. And at Super Friendly, we were really lucky to work with and consult with some of the most recognizable brands in the world, uh, places like United Airlines and Pfizer and, um, and Puma and ExxonMobil on their design systems. And so what I'd like to do uh, is share some of the observations and patterns that I've seen over the last decade out, over working with hundreds of different organizations and on their design systems so that you can learn from some of those patterns too. I tweeted this almost, almost exactly uh, last year, one, one year ago, I tweeted this, that I'm so thrilled for a design system team that I've been working with. The team formed on February 7th, and then yesterday, this was in April, yesterday, only 61 days later, they shipped design system version 1.0.0, and a feature team implemented, adopted a component, which was checklist item, um, into their code base, saying it saved them a week of dev time. And I think that is a really great success story. Um, it's a simple success story, but it's actually one that a lot of teams don't tend to have. Um, now, this company, this wasn't the first time that they tried their design system and, and worked on a design system. It was actually their fourth time trying to get a design system in place. So one of the things that I want to leave you with here today, I know I have a few minutes to share some stuff. So the big lesson today you know, that we can talk about in the Q&A is it is never too late to revive your design system. You could be on the fourth try. This could be five years in, or it could be day one, the first time you're ever trying it. No matter where you are in that journey, then this is something that you can do. You can ship a design system, you can get it adopted. You've got to do it well. So I want to share with you some of the tips and tricks that I've learned in how to do that well. So maybe you're thinking that something that my clients often come out and ask me, they say like, okay, Dan, so you've helped hundreds of companies with their design system. What is the process that you use to be able to help with design systems? And I, and I think honestly, I think they're looking for some fancy diagram that looks like this with circles and arrows and things that point up and loops and stuff like that and that show up when you do a Google image search for design process, right? Like they want they want a, a simple answer. Our process is like first we celebrate, then we congregate, then we fornicate, then we triangulate, you know, blah, 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 like that kind of stuff. And I just have never had that stuff at Super Friendly. We never had that stuff. The, the answer that we often gave was like, you know, I'd say something like, well, there's like about 50 things that we would do over the course of three to four months. And so those clients would say, okay, well, like what, what kind of things? Um, and then I would just rattle off a bunch of stuff. I try to describe it in more ways than I should in a sales call and they get really confused. And I said, so instead one day, my managing director, Crystal Vitelli and I, we decided let's just write down all of our steps in detail and, and see what comes out of that. And what came out of that turned out to be this workbook that we made. Uh, and this workbook is called Design System in 90 Days. Now, like I said, I only have a few minutes here. So I'm gonna share what I consider to be some of the most important steps in this workbook. I'm not gonna share all 52 steps. I'm gonna give you three that I think if you you just followed those three, it'll get you on the right path. Um, the workbook isn't currently available. I took it down recently to work on an updated version of it. But if you like what you hear and you want to see more of the steps at the end of this talk, I'll let you know where you can find it once it's re-released re next month. So make sure you're paying attention for that if that's something that you're interested in. Now, overall, the all of us here who work on design systems, we want our design systems to go the distance. Components are the lifeblood of design systems. And so 
the first place to start is like, all right, where's our first component? You know, what is our first component going to be? Or even if you already have a design system, imagine that you are restarting it, right? We have a design system, no one really uses it. So we're just going to like give it a, give it a kickstart, give it a jump start. We're going to, we're going to start with a new component. What's that component going to be? Now, whatever you just thought in your head, I want you to remember that answer. You don't have to type it in the chat. Although you can if you want. Um, what's that first component going to be? And if you've seen my tweets about this event, you probably know where, where this is headed. If you haven't, that's cool too. I, I just want you to hang on to that, that answer for a minute because I believe that this is the single biggest misstep that leads to design system. I call them ghost towns and graveyards, which is essentially design systems that no one, no one uses or that no one will ever use. This line of thinking, I think, sets design system teams off on an unproductive journey, and then they fool themselves into thinking that they're doing worthy work. So what is it? What do so many design system teams think is the first no-brainer component that they should tackle? For a lot of teams, it's button. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand for those of you who didn't write anything in the chat, but take stock of whether button was the first thing that you thought of. It seems obvious, right? It seems really simple. Every team needs a button somewhere in their features. Button's such a simple component. And in my experience, innocent, simple button component has been the slippery slope downfall of so many design system teams. Because once you have button done, then you think, well, we have button, so we should probably have some general typography styles and a base color palette to find and some other foundations like form elements and headers and footers. And so what I'd like to do here is I'd like to explore why button is such a poor starting point. Now, first, let me say that from a technical standpoint, button is deceptively complex. Those of you who have worked on button before, you know how unwieldy it can become very, very quickly. So I'm not going to get into the technical nature of button component right now. But if you're curious, ask about it in the Q&A if you want to arm wrestle about that a little bit. I'm just talking strategically right now with button. So everybody thinks, you know, let's start with simple button. It is the atomic building block of any good design system. We can execute it really quickly. We can consolidate the dozens of versions of buttons that we have in organization and create a lot more consistency and very quickly they end up trading many versions of button for even more variations of buttons, right? It's, de it's definitely a, a good step in a good direction. But if you don't get the two things that are really important, you don't get the two things that are really important about the first component you do. And those two things are, number one, you want it to be fast to create. And number two, you want it to be instantly adopted. Now, button is often slow to create because there's a lot of variations you need right out of the gate. Solid buttons, ghost buttons, secondary buttons, tertiary buttons, icon buttons, no icon buttons, you know, all those kinds of things. Button is often slow to create and all the variations and almost they're almost never high priority enough for a product team to interrupt their sprint cycle to implement. So button often doesn't do the trick, even though it's deceptively simple about that. Now, another way that I want to share why doing button uh, first is a terrible early component is that it flies in the face of basically where I've learned everything that I've learned about design systems or design or just work in general. It's a big source of inspiration in my life. And that source is movies. Okay, so uh, write in the chat. How many of you have ever been to prison? No, I'm just kidding. Don't 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 write that in the chat. I'm just kidding. Um, what does move? What do movies tell us though? And what do movies teach us? Is the best and quickest way to get respect when you are the new inmate on the block? Well, you're supposed to go and fight the biggest guy around. I want to show you a little video. We'll watch a clip uh, for just a few minutes here, and then we'll come back and talk about what it means. Like the future holds our dreams compared to what's behind me. Check out the new meat. I'm gonna slather you up in Navi and jelly. <laughs> Go to town. Let's make something clear. This one here is our booty. You wanna get to him? You go through us. Or, more accurately, we go through you. I'm with them. All right, so just a little fun in honor of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 week, which opens this weekend. I'm not sponsored by Marvel, although I wish I was. So Marvel, if you're listening, let's talk. 
Um, now, isn't that the kind of swag and swagger that we want our, our, and respect that we want our design system team to have, right? Like we want all, all the product teams to be like, I'm with them. You know, if you go to all the product teams and you're offering little old button component, they're going to laugh you out of the room, right? What team needs another team to provide button to them? But if you decided to take on one of the more complex or nastiest or most intimidating components in the company, that instead might earn you some respect. So how do you identify what those components are? Well, essentially what you do is you ask around. And there are three sets of activities that I wrote about in this workbook that help you get these answers quickly. And I want to share those activities to you. Uh, with you, excuse me. The first activity is to collect feature teams roadmaps. So what you do is you want to get your hands on whatever is used at your organization to plan quarterly initiatives and to facilitate conversations about prioritization. What are the feature teams at your organization planning to do in the next three months? Have conversations about this. Where have they broadcasted those plans? Can you get them from Jira? Can you get them in a roadmap somewhere? Are they on GitHub? Is it documented in Google Docs or in Confluence? That's really what you're after is you want to know what are the things that are coming up for uh, for a lot of the teams in the next quarter or over the next uh, the next two quarters or three quarters how you track this can be really simple um, i often just use a fig jam for this you know here's a quick example a screenshot here this is a fig jam that lets you know at a glance what's coming up um, links are good to, to track here screenshots are even better so what what we see here on the slide is that you know we talked to four teams for example the payments team the bookings team the social team and the flights team and they just in each of these areas we just have links you know one links out to a Google Doc roadmap, one links out to OKRs and, and Jira. Um, one team doesn't have a formal roadmap yet, so and that's due at the end of the month. So we just put a note there to like hang, you know, sit tight and, and we'll see. Another one has a full Jira board. So you know, a screenshot of that Jira board and a link to that Jira board. You just want to track those things so you know the things that are coming up for the, pro the product teams and feature teams so that you can meet them there with some design system things that you're actually going to be making. The second activity that I want to mention here is interviewing potential design system customers. So make a list of 15 to 20 people who you think would benefit from using the design system once it has a handful of components in it. Uh, uh, interview each person for like 30 or 45 minutes and listen for stories of how product gets made. You don't want to ask them, what components do you need? Because that's a little bit of a shallow question. Instead, talk to them about their work. Talk to them about some of the things that they're making, some of the challenges, and that'll give you a much rounder perspective of what are some of the holes and some of the gaps that they actually need filled. Now, the reason that this is an important step is that this is how you avoid the slippery slope of the button component. Including the button component is honestly an answer to, to a question that nobody's asking. Nobody's saying, when can we get button component from someone else, right? But you're answering that question anyway, no one's asking it. In, in these interviews, instead, what I'd like you to listen for is something else. I'd like you to listen for people trying to tell you this. They're trying to answer this question. Where do you need help? And they're, they're going to say, or they're going to signal, even if they don't use these exact words, here's where we need help. Right, Few people are going to be waiting for you to swoop in and save the day by creating an amazing button component that they couldn't make themselves, but they might be waiting for you to save the day on some other component, and those are some of the things that you want to be listening for. Uh, the third activity, and I'll give an example of this next, the third activity is to then schedule product and feature walkthroughs with all of the teams. Uh, track down the emails of the promising teams, product owners or design leads or engineering leads, and schedule some time to walk through their products with them. It could be an existing version of their product. It could be comps or sketches or wireframes of what their new feature or their new product is going to look like. Basically, inventory what they are doing, what they have done, and it allows you to make a map of where you can help. So here's what that map looks like. Like, and again, this is easily tracked in a fig jam. I like doing this in fig jam. I've done it in keynote or PowerPoint or Google slides before I've done it in word docs. I've done it on whiteboard. So how you track it is not that important. It's just a matter. It's just important that you track something here in some way that you can circulate. So one thing that you can do here is you can create a surface area for each team that you're going to talk to. So for, we're going to use the same, the same teams as an example, the payments team, the social team, the booking team, and the flights team. And then as you're talking to the payments team, just look at the things on their interface that they're showing you. Ideally, this is a screen share if you're doing it remotely, or if you're doing it in person, ask them to walk you through any interfaces. That could be sketches, or it could be comps, or it could be actual builds you know, in software. And I'd just like you to list the, th the, the components that you see. All right, so here's an example where as the payments team was walking us through this, walking my team through this, we were just writing down components. Ooh, we see a menu component, we see a button component, we see an accordion component, we see a toggle, a select, a tooltip, you know, all of these kinds of things. Then you do the same thing, you go to the next team, meet with the social team, write down all the components that you see in the work that they either have done or are about to do. 
Same thing with the booking team. You catalog their components. Same thing with the flights team. And then this is where it gets interesting. This is where it gets really valuable. What you do from there is now that you have this, this map, you can start to see what things are common. Right? And that's the thing that makes a system. You can go, what, what are all the components that all of these teams or a subset of these teams are actually using? Not everybody uses the icon component. Not everybody needs the switch component, which is all marked in, in this light pink color here. But almost all the teams are using a card component or a tab component or a tables component. There's at least two of these teams that are using those. So now we're starting to create, like we're starting to understand what are the things that are common problems that these teams are starting to solve. Once you have those common problems, then you can sort them and you can rank them in order, right? You can say, well, autocomplete, four teams out of four teams that we talk to need four teams out of four teams that we talk to need button group or need card. Only three teams need rating or badge or tables. And you can start to do these things and tackle them in order. What does this, sh this screen tell you? Uh, it tells you who is who is the toughest, meanest component that you should take down right now. Who's the nastiest, most intimidating one? Autocomplete, why? because it is the toughest and meanest one. That's why you do that one. I think one of the primary responsibilities of a design system team is to take on the most difficult complex work so that it becomes easier for someone else. And I think that's the most important work of design system teams to make the work easier for everyone that follows after you. Now, we're almost at our time here. So, you know, I shared a very small slice and combination of plays and activities that you can run to put your design system on track or get it back on track. Uh, and what's cool is that you can do this anytime. I've done this process and, and started this way with teams that are brand new design system teams on day one. I've also done this with teams that are in year five and year six of having their design system that just wanted to get it running a little bit more tightly and, and have better adoption. So this process can work anytime, you know, anywhere uh, in your design journey. If you're discouraged about where your design system is right now, it is never too late to turn it around. You can always make a commitment to tackle, you can make a commitment today to tackle the most difficult thing that your organization is facing. Tackle the nastiest, most intimidating, most complex one so that other people can benefit from that. Last slide here, I mentioned earlier, I'd let you know where to find my Design System in 90 Days workbook. I'm gonna be re-releasing it through the new initiative that I've been working on called Design System University, and you'll be able to find even more content and curriculum and community to support how you design at scale. Um, design System University officially opens in June, so if you're interested, head to Design System University, excuse me, designsystem.university to find out more. You can sign up for the mailing list or follow on any of the social accounts, and you'll know when that workbook is re-released, likely will, it will be in June. Uh, with that, whew, I want to say thank you to the Zeppelin team for allowing me a few minutes to share some thoughts with all of you. Thank you to all of you for being great listeners. And most of all, thank you to Joel Embiid for playing at the highest level and making Sixers fans proud. Uh, Mike, back over to you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dan. And wow. Um, oh, okay. Uh, we got the the, we got the emojis popping off <laughs> right here. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Um, okay, so yeah, now we'll do a, a little bit of, of Q&A with, with you, Dan. Um, actually, uh, we have our first question here, um, and this is from Colleen. I think, is this uh, Colleen? Is this the Colleen that I know? Uh, I think I've worked with Colleen probably a, a couple times here. But uh, yeah, Colleen is asking, um, why don't you start with, say, an open source uh, design system? You can then brand it, so maybe something like uh, Material, right? Uh, and update it, yeah, uh, yeah, like like Google Material. Why don't you start with that, and then maybe you can you can tweak it a little bit uh, to your your firm's needs. You kind of get the the foundation that way really easily. It'll speed up um, how quickly you can deliver value to to your team, to your organization. Is that a is that a good way to to start there? Uh, it can be a good way. So I'm going to tell you what, you know, as with lots of things, the answer is depends, but I'd like to tell you what it, I think it depends on. Um, it is a good strategy for lots of teams to start with a bootstrap or a material design or a, a chakra or some of the great open source design systems that are out there because there, there's a lot of them and a lot of people have put a lot of good work into those. Um, what ends up happening though is at some point, um, and those of you who have used material design before or bootstrap or use any sort of boilerplate, you know this this well. At some point, you start to fight the system more than you start to use it or, or more than you're using it. Um, with mm -hmm. design, systems, I find that to be around the year two, year two to three mark. So somewhere in there. So what I generally recommend is 
if you are, if you want to just get up and running, especially if you're a startup or you're a new team and you just need to get something out the door right away, you don't want to invest in creating a design system. And you're like, within the next two to three years, we know we're going to refactor this. Then by all means, use material. It's awesome. It's great. It's uh, there's so much good work that's been put into that. Um, around the two or three year mark, you're going to start to go like, it just doesn't have the stuff in it that we need. And so I'm going to end up taking stuff out of it more than I am actually using the stuff that's there. If you mm -hmm. want a design system to last more than three years, I think it's a, a good investment to, to create one from scratch. It'll be longer to get to that, that like adoption point and to get to the point where you can actually use it, but it'll also last you longer. So that's a general guideline that I give to teams is like somewhere in the two to three year mark. If you're like, we're going to, we're going to refactor long before then, uh, don't waste your time creating one from scratch. Awesome. And I guess, um, I mean, first off, yeah, totally makes sense. Um, I guess I'm wondering how would a team know, you know, looking, if right now you're sitting around and you're thinking, oh, I don't even know if I should start a design system. I mean, how then do you know, you know, two or three years down the line that I might refactor this thing, you know? So as a team, how do you, um, how do you understand that? And then how do you plan for, these contingencies that, you know, kind of seem far in the future, maybe far out there, you're not sure. And how do you like gather that information and, and deal with that uncertainty? Um, so there's no guarantees in that. Um, and part of the reason for that is because organizations are volatile, especially organizations that run tech wings or arms or, or are, you know, tech is their product. Um, it, you know, it's hard because customers change and consumers change and trends change and all that kind of stuff. One thing that I'll say is what you, one thing that you can use as an indicator is you can look ahead at your roadmap, at your company's roadmap, not the design system roadmap, but the company's roadmap. And you can go, what do we think we're going to be doing in, in the next three years? A lot of teams that I've worked with have a three-year vision, you know, something like that, where they're able to look three years from now and say, three years from now, we are going to look like a very different company. We want to look like a very different company. We are trying to look like a very different company. And if that's the case, there's a good chance that your design system should change, you know, and probably will change along with the company. Company. Um, some companies, though, are like, in three years, we want to be doing exactly what we're doing right now, but just a little bit better. In that case, maybe you can you can predict a little bit that your design system should stay and kind of be a, a staple of the the consistency in your organization. So I would uh, that would be the first place that I look is just looking at your company's roadmap and going like, who do we want to be as an organization? And then how does our design system as a tool fit into that strategy? Mm -hmm. Right. OK, cool. And uh, okay, great. So we have a uh, we have Stephanie in the chat here highlighting some uh, some questions for us. So they pop up right when we're done. It's very uh, very punctual. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so great. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Dan, you can see this here, but um, yeah, tips for adoption for uh, these major releases that you're doing. And yeah, I mean, it's classic. Even at Zeppelin, when we're doing big releases, right? We all kind of, uh, or at least back in the day, we would sit you know, next to the ship it button and we'd all be really nervous. And even with all the testing, you know, you always build software, something's gonna break. And we'd sit there in a little, in a little hollow and we click it and then we just wait, you know? And then, you know, obviously the, um, it goes out and the, the tickets come in and, you know, obviously some, some things are broken, but uh, yeah, how do you, um, I guess, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that? And um, here we're talking about, um, yeah, encouraging those migrations in, in established systems too. Oh, I think you might be uh, muted, Dan. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we got you. Cool. All right. Um, I'm really glad that you brought in the Zeppelin example because I think we talk a lot in the industry about design systems being products, but I don't think that people actually believe that. Like we don't we don't often see them as products. We have to look at them like the way that we would look at a Zeppelin or a Google uh, or Gmail or something like like how would you release uh, something in a product? And so I, I think um, the 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 moment in time that you're in can dictate your speed and also how much caution you might have. Pre-version one for a design system, you can make a lot of changes, right? And they don't affect a lot of people because pre-version one, you might have a few beta teams using it. They might already be bought in with the idea that like, yeah, we know things are going to change. It's going to be a little bit volatile. Post-version one, you've got to be very, very careful about the changes that you make, right? So like, so that's, that's with any good product. With any product, you know, your V0.8 and your V0.9 is like, they could be drastically different and your customers are cool with it. The difference between... 1.0.0 and even 1.1.0, you know, much less 2.0, uh, 
are going to be very drastically different. So you have to handle the change management well of some of those things. I think one of the things that that I work with teams a lot on is separating the idea of the work and then the scaling of the work. So, you know, how might you release something to an entire company? I wouldn't do it all at once. <laughs> I'd do it team by team, you know, you know or, or a handful, you know, a, a subset of teams in that way. So before making major version releases, I, you know, I've seen some teams go from like 1.0 to 2.0. And it's like, you have everything from 1.1 to 1.1.1, 1.1.2. Like you have all of those versions to figure some stuff out and allow the scale to kind of happen gradually. Some teams just don't do that, right? They're just, they just get so excited about what they have in version two that it causes a lot of pain for people to readopt, you know, a, a completely brand new thing. So it's not even readoption anymore at that point. It's adoption of a new thing. So I think it's, I think it's the change management process that needs to be done well, not necessarily the versioning process. I, mean, I think a lot of people, a lot of teams spend time more on the versioning part and the build part than they do the change management part. That's right. Okay, cool. And uh, I was just checking out the chat here. Yeah, we have this really, really popular one. This is upvoted uh, 17 times. And design tokens is like, I feel like it's been this huge topic for so long, right? We even have these working groups where we're trying to establish a standard language for design tokens. I think I think you might actually be a, a part of those, Dan, uh, and, and Zeppelin is too, yeah. Um, but it, it's just been this, this giant topic for so long and like a, a hot topic too. Um, so the first thing I feel like people always talk about when we talk about design tokens is naming conventions, right? Uh, it's like the, you know, it's the, and even if you name them correctly, it's like you never did. Even if you named it correctly, you didn't name it correctly. Um, so yeah, here we have Lex and Lex is um, asking, you know, when you're starting a design system, when you're starting with design tokens, how should you start? How should you start naming those? What is the formula? Um, what is, what does that look like? Oh, I'm gonna get in such trouble for this. Um, no one, no one likes my answer. Whenever I answer this question, nobody likes my answer. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, prepare yourself for a very unpopular thing. I, I have a tweet that's been drafted for months now. I, maybe I'll hit publish on it today. But <laughs> the tweet is like, I swear, people spend more time naming their design tokens than they do like their kids and their pets. <laughs> it's like it's ridiculous. It's it's not that important. Um, so my answer to this is is generally. <laughs> Uh, like I've seen teams succeed with any kind of naming. So what I've learned is that, you know, whatever you name, on, whatever you name it, it just matters that you agree on the name, that the team agrees on the name and the people using it agree. Of course, easier said than done. Like that's a very simple thing that, that's, that's hard to implement. But, but it's a simple idea. It's, it doesn't matter what you agree on. It just matters that you agree. And so one of the techniques that I use with teams a lot is, um, is we don't spend a lot of time on the naming. We spend a lot of time on the evangelizing of the name. And then the one, one trick that I use all the time is I, I ask a team to live with a name for a particular period of time, at which point we will retire it and decide whether we want to keep it. So, so I give mm -hmm. them a shelf life. We're going to pick this name and use it for the next six weeks, right? It, and, and so for six weeks, oh, it's okay if it's wrong. It's a problem if like, wait, we're going to pick a name today and it has to last for the next six years and 6,000 <laughs> people have to use it. Well, that's that's a lot of pressure. But what I, what I say, so I try to reduce that pressure for teams. Let's pick this name. Let's use it with three teams for the next six weeks. And then in six weeks, what we're going to decide is that this name we're going to change. So it's not that we're going to stick with it. Right. Because we could just default to stick with it. We're actually going to change it and we have to actively choose to keep it. And I think those are the kinds of rituals that allow teams to be comfortable with a name because it's it's not the name that matters, you know. And the story that I always tell, and again, and people hate this story, is that I worked with a team who who named a component Fred, and the component had been named Fred for seven years. They used the name Fred, and it worked great for them. I'm not advocating that people name name their components Fred. What I'm advocating is they had a culture where that was acceptable and lasted. Right. So who cares if it's good or bad, objectively good or bad? That's the thing that we need from it. Uh, of course, people don't like that. They want they uh, they want the technical, you know, here is the objective great name for this. And honestly, I've never found it in, in my career. Yeah, um, it's so funny. And uh, I guess Fred became famous in his company after that, like all these people using his component. And now they're, you know, this guy got all this uh, all this fanfare around him. I think uh, it's interesting, Dan, because something we talked about a lot, which is there's this cultural component to design systems that people don't talk about uh, too often, right? And like creating this groundswell movement and uh, 
going to this like holy place where you all agree on naming convention and what components to build and how to use your design system. Uh, it's just like that, that piece, that movement piece, that cultural piece, it's almost bigger than the technical piece of actually building the components and of using and driving adoption of your design system. It's just coming together and agreeing that, hey, we're gonna use this, we're gonna name this like this. Uh, that piece in your organization can be the, the toughest part. 100%. I, I, I have never seen a design system fail for, well, maybe not never. The majority of times I've seen a design system fail or succeed, it is very rarely about technical things. It's very rarely that like, ah, uh, you know, we didn't get naming right, so nobody uses this thing. You know, we didn't get, you know, uh, we didn't get the the React components architected the right way, so no one uses it. it. It's very rarely that those things are fixable and they're they're fairly easily fixable. Um, what I've seen though is like that team just doesn't know how to use it, you know, or that team just doesn't have time, or yeah. you know, things like that 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 are all cultural things, right? We don't have a culture of making time for stuff like this, so why would we expect we would do it for a design system? We don't have a culture of coming together and agreeing on things. We have a culture of individual teams get to do whatever they want. So why would we why would we uh, expect that a company wide tool would would just adopt well, right? Like the 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 organs or what is it? The host is going to reject the organ, of course, yeah. of course it will. Mm -hmm. It's foreign. So I think we need to have softer landings for those kinds of things, and that's that, that's all culture stuff. That's all about because you're introducing something abnormal, and culture is about what is normal here. So when you introduce something that is abnormal, of course it's going to be rejected for a while. So what are the things that you can do to make it more normal? That's that's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, Dan, um, it's always uh, fantastic to uh, to pick your brain, uh, and the conversations are always enlightening with you. So uh, I appreciate you for teaching me some stuff here, and uh, I know that you've taught. Uh, a lot to our to our guests here as well. So I wanted to thank you for coming on. Uh, today was a, a fantastic, um, a fanta a fantastic talk, a fantastic day with you. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you. So Mike, thank you so much uh, for all the great questions and and for having me. Thank you everybody who's who's joined. And uh, yeah, I know we we didn't get to a bunch of questions. So if you still have them, hit me up on wherever LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, please don't send me an email. I'll never reply to it. Uh, <laughs> so anywhere else other than that. And uh, and yeah, I'd love love to hear more of your questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, we at Zeppelin will be reaching out to some of you too to make sure that your questions get answered. Uh, join us in our Discord. Follow us on socials. And uh, thank you. We'll uh, we'll see you later. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.